everyone. Welcome to my channel, Kindred Souls in Brooklyn. And folks, tonight I want to do a really heartwarming, endearing video about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, I was born in 1965, long after the Dodgers had left in 1957. They started their first season in 58 in California. But I grew up with my parents who were diehard Brooklyn Dodgers fans. I'm a big Mets fan. And the reason why the Mets, a lot of people don't realize this, the reason why the Mets have blue and orange in their logo was a tribute for the Dodgers and the Giants, you know, because they didn't, heaven forbid, that, you know, people should become American League fans and root for the Yankees, right? So, um, worked for me. I'm a big Mets fan. So, folks, stay tuned for a really cool video. I want to talk about why the Dodgers are missed so much in Brooklyn. I mean, I, I want to tell you a personal story, too, that I grew up on the same block as um, Tex Rickards, who was actually the PA announcer for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And therein lies the secret was that the Dodgers were such a wholesome group that Brooklyn embraced them. But stay tuned. I have a little video to show you about the Brooklyn Dodgers, like a little history thing, which is really cool. And then we'll get into talking about the Brooklyn Dodgers and why Brooklyn still misses them to this day. Hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned. But even with this going on, it was unthinkable that it would ever happen. We heard it, but 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 but, but it, it couldn't happen. It, it just could not happen. When the '57 season came about, and again they were playing games in Jersey City, and the solution of a new ballpark hadn't materialized yet, then it became a little more evident that hey, this could possibly. What do you think of the idea of the Dodgers moving to Los Angeles? I don't like the idea. How about the Dodgers moving to Queens? I don't like that idea either. Well, where would you rather see them if you had to choose between the two? I'd rather see them right here in Brooklyn. By the time the Dodgers played their last game at Ebbets Field in late September, callous indifference had set in. A 67-year run was ending, and only 6,200 people showed up to see the final act. Do you realize there weren't many fans there? Hardly any fans there. But we stayed out to say bye to them. And boy, there were more people crying than you were going to shake a stick at me. Why did they do it? You say, ah, go on. I don't want to see you anymore. Go. We're done with you. When it became official in a press release on October 8th, 1957, it was the shot heard round the world all over again for Dodger fans. It happened. It's the first time you realize that something that you thought could never go is gone. There were no more Dodgers. There was no more nothing. People tried to explain it's business, this, that, and the other. When you're eight years old, you don't give a damn about business. You give a damn about where's Duke? Where's Carl Erskine? Carl Farello? Clem LeBine? Where's Gil Hodges? And Los Angeles might as well have been Saturn. It was so far away. They left us. They left us. There's a bitterness that's never going to leave us because they never had to leave us. You know when we really knew they were gone? When they tore that place down. They had this wrecking ball, been painted white, and someone had put some simulated stitches on it, looked like a big baseball. They swung the ball over the visitor's dugout as many times as we had hated who was over there. When they dropped that ball, I got So I'm here in downtown Sarasota, right near where I work, and I came over here because they have this amazing statue here. It's called Surrender, and it uh, immortalizes when Japan surrendered in World War II and the famous image of the sailor kissing the nurse in Times Square. And the reason I'm here with this is because it was very symbolic for Brooklyn and for the Dodgers because when you grow up in Brooklyn in the time that I did, born in 65, there were three things that pretty much all the people, all the older, older people talked about when you grew up. And one of them was the snowstorm in 1947. Another one was ninth, uh, World War II. And the third one was the Brooklyn Dodgers. And, and, this, and that's really the whole key, folks, is that the Brooklyn Dodgers remain 
such a beloved aspect of Brooklyn. And I'm going to tell you why, because so many people, so many people that I met, we had a store in Brooklyn for 25 years, and there were certain things that were so consistent living in Brooklyn. And for me, I'm going to tell you the story now about living on the block of uh, where Tex Records uh, actually lived. So I'm going to put a picture up here now of Tex Records, and uh, let me move this one over. Yeah, I'll put it right up there. You guys have seen it. Um, I'll put a picture up here of Tex Records, and Tex Records actually was the public address announcer for um, for, the, for the Dodgers, and he was the public address announcer from 1924 all the way up until 1957, their last season. In fact, he refused to go to uh, Los Angeles, so in 1958, when that team moved out there, someone else took over that job. So I grew up on Prospect Avenue, and between 10th and 11th, and Tex Records actually... I grew up, so Prospect Avenue between 10th and 11th is a really long block. So if you picture it, um, I actually live like at the, at the top of the block, you know, the first, first say 25% of the block. And Tex Rickards and his wife lived halfway down the block. So growing up on that block was incredible because I got to, I used to actually do shopping for Mrs. Rickards. Uh, Tex, I don't remember what year he passed away, but it had to have been... I'm going to say in the 70s at some point. So when I was kind of in the 6th, 7th grade, I, we always had dogs. And Mrs. Rickards, uh, at this point, she was kind of like a shut-in. So she would always ask my, my friends and myself to go to the store for her, which was fine because she always gave us a little tip. And also, you know, we had key food at the end of the block on 11th Avenue, which was Boac before key food. And then uh, we had a deli on the corner. So it was really no problem for us to go to the shopping for her. I'll change the view a little bit. Special shout out to Lewis. I know Lewis likes it when I change the view. Um, Lewis is one of our directors. He's a fabulous guy. Um, anyway, the reason I'm telling you the story about Mrs. Ricketts and I'm gonna, tell, I'm gonna share some stories about Tex Ricketts is that basically folks, people, the reason why the Dodgers were so beloved and why no other team would ever come close to this is because the Dodgers lived in and around the community. You know, I'm a big baseball fan, no knock against the Yankees, but even back in the, in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, the Yankees were considered the Broadway team. They didn't have to work, they made a higher salary, you know, but the Brooklyn Dodgers actually lived in Bay Ridge. They lived in, around Flatbush Avenue. You know, so that's why if you come to Brooklyn today, you'll see so many avenues. And I guess if you're not a baseball fan, you wouldn't realize it. But, you know, there's Gil Hodges Bowling Alley. There's a shopping center toward Kennedy Airport, Erskine Shopping Center. These are all people. These are all Dodgers. And the reason why they were so beloved is because they were very visible in the community. Now, I remember hearing stories from my mom and my dad so many times, so many people in the neighborhood telling us how the Brooklyn Dodgers actually worked. You know, they couldn't afford not to work in the off-season. You know, and back then, there were no personal trainers. So some of the guys would actually take jobs as um, laborers. Some guys would sell cars. But the fact of the matter is, is that whether they were selling cars, whether they were playing baseball, these guys lived in regular apartments. In fact, Gil Hodges' family still lives in the same apartment or still owns the same apartment where they lived originally. A lot of those original families still have those same places. And they were very visible. They didn't go with posses or bodyguards or, you know, after a game, after a Dodger game, uh, which, you know, the Dodgers played pretty much where, uh, right in the same spot where Barkley Stadium is right now where the New York, where the New York Nets play. Um, they would actually go to Coney Island and they, they would always have a lot of fun. They would go and they'd, They'd pitch the ball and they'd clean out, you know, the stuffed animals and they would give them out to the kids. I mean, these were regular people, regular guys who would say hello to you. They'd be shopping in the supermarkets. So this was the difference, folks. That's why the Dodgers were so beloved was because they were approachable. They didn't think, you know, no one thought they were better than somebody else. And most of these guys are really, they had that appeal. And this is what lasted throughout. So when the Dodgers left Brooklyn, this is what this is what was missed by the people. It was it, it was such a beloved feeling, and these guys were just you know no, none of the players made what they make today. But at the same time, the Dodgers were so approachable. So I want to talk next about a couple of Tex Rickard stories because everybody, depending on where you grew up in Brooklyn, maybe you grew up close to Gil Hodges, maybe you grew up close to this one. I grew up next to near Tex Rickards, and I'm going to tell you some Tex Rickard stories, which I think you're going to enjoy if you're a Dodger fan or a baseball fan. So I just have to show you this really, really. This is the uh, 
back end of this, but what's real, what I really want to tell you is the greatest generation is what my parents were, is the people who basically fought in World War II or supported it. And talk about the greatest generation, I don't want to get too close, there's an older couple right there learning how to dance right near the statue of the surrender. They, he probably served in the war. Just incredible, the things you see. And I just thought this would be so appropriate to show uh, on this here, and because uh, I think it fits the video. This is a good spot. So I'm gonna put up a picture here of Tex Rickards. And uh, I don't remember ever meeting Tex, but I really spoke to his, his, his wife many, many times. And I'll tell you some stories, some Tex Rickards stories, some Mrs. Rickards stories. So the first one is I love dogs. And the reason why I would do a lot of the shopping for, uh, from, for Mrs. Rickards was because my friends and I all shared in it, but basically I did it the most often because uh, I had a dog and I used to walk my dog and she would tell me, hey, come over. She, had, she was always be in the window and she would ask me to go shopping for her. So uh, anyway, what was funny was that Mr. and Mrs. Ricketts loved Boston uh, ter Terrier dogs. I wanna put Tex Ricketts picture up right here and tell you some Tex Ricketts stories. I never met Tex. I, don't, I, mean, I imagine I probably did, but I'm just, I was probably too young to remember it. But, Mrs. Ricketts, I was I used to go shopping for all the time, and I'll tell you they loved Boston Terrier dogs. Now I love dogs, so that was like the first you know thing. I was always walking my dog, so that's why she would tell me most often to come in and go shopping for her. So they loved Boston Terriers, and it was funny they always named them Happy. Now I didn't know Happy number one. Maybe I did. I, maybe I was too young to remember, but I knew Happy two toward the end of his life, and I knew probably Happy three, the most. Uh, he was probably the most. Uh, common one that I knew because that was when I did the most shopping for her and so they just absolutely love their Boston Terrier dogs and they kind of all look the same they'd always get one that was always like like a tuxedo type and uh, so that's one thing about Tex Rickards that maybe you didn't know you big Boston uh, you big uh, Brooklyn Dodger fans out there and uh, another cool thing which you guys might know which is a story that she told me all the time Tex Ricketts was this great announcer and he was he was very colloquial you know and how he spoke and he was from Texas so you'd hear the Texas Texas sayings in there mixed with the Brooklyn so the, the saying he's probably most well known for is uh, basically the way Dodger Stadium was laid out the Brooklyn Dodger Stadium was people in the outfield could actually drape their clothes over like the outfield fence so Sometimes, you know, when it was too hot or the sun would shine, they would take the jackets off the overcoats and they'd hang them over like the outfield fence or the fences over there. And uh, one day Tex Rickards was uh, someone had told him, because as you can see in this picture, maybe you can't see it in the picture, but he used to sit downstairs in near the dugout, which was very different. I mean, when you think about the announcers today and the sky boxes and things like that, he sat right downstairs with the players. So... Anyway, so I guess one of the players must have come in and said, oh, we can't see the ball or, you know, a lot of times it's it's a reflection or something. So one of them was like, oh, can you tell the people just to lift their coats up off the fence or whatever? So Tex Ricketts turned around and got on the PA and he said, will the people in the outfield please take off their clothes? And that was, it, it was a laugh riot because the fans all started laughing. The people out there were embarrassed. Everyone thought it was great. I mean, you know, things were on so PC back then where someone could get in trouble for that. And of course, he didn't mean it that way, but of course, that's how the fans took it. So if you look up Tex Rickards, um, he, that's probably the thing he's most known for, the actual saying that he's most known for. And then of course, once it happened, it became a thing. So he would do it a little more frequently after that. But she always talked about that. She was a great woman. And again, she always spoke about the Dodgers and spoke about them by first name. You know, it, it was just a very different type of thing than what you see today. And, and whether it would still be repeated today, I don't know. But when people wonder why the Dodgers are so beloved, that's the reason. That's the reason. So, uh, the third largest cemetery in the world is, I grew up right near, it's called uh, Greenwood Cemetery. The man who Ebbets Field is named after, Mr. Ebbets, is actually buried in that cemetery. So from cradle to grave, you know, it seemed, the Dodgers were very Brooklyn. And this was the thing. And, you know, to this day, like I said, you come to Brooklyn. If you look up some of these Dodgers names, if you're ever going to visit Brooklyn, just do yourself a favor. Look up like the most popular Dodgers. And then when you come to Brooklyn, as you drive around, you'll notice the streets and you'll say, wow, I didn't realize that was a Dodger. That was whatever. Because, you know, time was really ticking. I mean, it's been, what, over 60 years since the Dodgers have left. But 
there are still, I mean, if you go especially to the Mets games, I mean, I'm a big Mets fan, as I told you, you could still go to City Field and still meet a lot of the people, women and men, who are Dodger fans, and they'll talk about the Dodgers, and they'll, they'll recount all these stories. I mean, you know, each person has their own individual story. I mean, another one that I heard very frequently, again, living near Prospect Park, uh, that's where I grew up between Prospect Park and Greenwood Cemetery, was that... Of course, people would walk through Prospect Park at all hours and, you know, people felt kind of more protected back then. They would walk through Prospect Park. They would come to Dodger Stadium, uh, Dodger Stadium, Ebbets Field, and they would turn around and they would just kind of like, a lot of times they would just look through the fence. You know, it really wasn't like it was today. And here's another big thing that I hear. That if I had to say one thing that I heard the most about growing up in Brooklyn, about the Dodgers, was a story that everyone probably told me through the store and through growing up, was when the Dodger game was on, of course it was on radio, right? If you went to the store, you went to the deli, you went to a pizzeria, you wouldn't miss one play of the Dodgers. If you were listening to the Dodger game in your house or your apartment, and you decided to go out to the deli, well, when you walked on the street, you would hear on the radio the game playing, and you wouldn't miss one pitch. You'd walk along, you turn around, you go into the pizzeria. They'd have the game on in the pizzeria. It was just a tremendous devotion to a team. And it was great because, you know, most of the time they didn't win. You know, they, they got better as, as time went on. And uh, they actually only won one world championship, 1955. I'm so happy that they won one before they left because uh, it just capped things off. At least Brooklyn got to see a winner at one point, you know. It, it would have been great. If you're not ready to go out and buy a Brooklyn Dodgers hat yet, let me tell you another two more words that make you want to do it. Jackie Robinson. You think about it, 1947, the color barrier was broken. The first time a black player ever played in the major leagues, he played for the Dodgers, he played in Brooklyn. Why? Because Brooklyn is the city of immigrants. That's, we accept everybody, race, creed, religion, gender, doesn't matter to this day. That's why Brooklyn is such a wonderful place to live. Through all the complaints, through all the things that you hear about the subway or different kind of crazy things, we accept everybody. And the fact that Jackie Robinson played for Brooklyn, broke the color barrier, his numbers retired in every major league stadium across the country. Why? Because Brooklyn was the place. You know, and did he meet a lot of opposition when he went to, you know, on travel and trips and whatever? Yeah, he did. But in Brooklyn, he was widely accepted. And Pee Wee Reese was big good friends with him and everyone accepted him because basically that's what Brooklyn is about you know we may be a nutty crazy place we may drive really fast maybe we don't have the best patience in the world but the reality is is everybody is welcome to live in Brooklyn that's why it's such a great wonderful place to live and that's why so many people want to live there and that's for, for those of us who've moved for whatever reason uh, we still love Brooklyn and that's why I do this channel because I absolutely love Brooklyn and uh, I just can't say enough great things about it. So I just think it's absolutely wonderful. And uh, though you guys should know that, which you probably already do. But folks, you say to yourself, if all these things were going great in Brooklyn, what's the age old question? Of course, this is a video in and of itself. Why did the Dodgers leave Brooklyn? Well, basically folks, it's always to do with the money. Essentially the Dodgers, Walter O'Malley wanted to stay in Brooklyn. Uh, pretty much two words, Robert Moses. If you know anything about Brooklyn or anything about New York and the boroughs, you know that Robert Moses, and I had done a video about this, Robert Moses was a city planner and he was in that office for a really long time. He was corrupt, he had a lot of power, a lot of influence. He ruined a lot of neighborhoods. In fact, the neighborhood where I grew up, they built, and I did a video on this, they built what they called the Prospect Expressway. And what he would do is he would use the power of eminent domain an eminent domain is basically whatever the government thinks your property is worth. You could be sitting on a gold mine, but if the property says it's worth $25,000, that's the going rate, that's what you get. And they pretty much destroyed um, entire neighborhoods. I mean, the 11218 zip code, they, they cut through the parish, and it was just, it destroyed about half the parish. And um, this is the parish right next door to Oz. And uh, he did that quite frequently. And... Uh, Basically, he wanted the Dodgers. The Dodgers needed a new stadium. He wanted to put it in Queens. And uh, Mr. O'Malley didn't want to go to Queens. No, other people didn't want to go to Queens. Also, if you got to think about going back to the uh, mid-50s when the Dodgers left in f after 57, 
the uh, St. Louis Cardinals in St. Louis, Missouri were the westernmost team in baseball. And if you think about a map of the United States, I'll put a little map up here and I'll show you. If you look at this map here, you'll see that half the country wasn't serviced by baseball. So they were really laying out the red carpet for the Dodgers. In fact, believe it or not, something I learned in doing research for this video, that's when cable TV started. The Dodgers were getting something like three or $400,000 a year in television rights. But if they went to California, that was like the beginning of cable TV and the rates were going up to two million. And another key sticking point was, besides Robert Moses, who was impossible, was New York charged all venues, uh, I don't know if they still do it, probably still do, a 5% venue tax. So in other words, 5% of whatever they made went back to the city. They were making like $9 million a year off the Dodgers had to give back to them. So there was no such tax in uh, California. So there was a lot of reasons why they left. But from all accounts, the Dodgers wanted to stay in Brooklyn. And uh, basically, Robert Moses did get his wish because after the Dodgers left in 57, and they started in 58 in California, my team came into being. Uh, people were hungry for a National League team. Uh, New York was the only city at that point that had three major league teams. At that point, they had won only the Yankees. And you know, back then, it was different than today. Players stayed on one team. Um, there's still fierce, fierce loyalties, but it was really fierce back then. And National League fans did not want to become American League fans. So, uh, Lord be praised, the Mets came into being. My team, the Amazons, came into being in 1962. And, uh, in fact, uh, Don Zimmer, who was a famous Yankee coach, a baseball lifer, he was an original Met. A lot of, I don't know if a lot of you Yankee fans out there know that, but he was an original Met. And of course, in later years, Don Zimmer was known. I'll put a little picture up of, of him over here wearing the helmet when, you know, during the playoffs when Pedro Martinez like threw him to the ground. So everyone called him Popeye, but Don Zimmer was a Dodger and he had so many wonderful things to say about the uh, about Brooklyn. And that's why he stayed pretty much local, as, as local as he could. And uh, he had an apartment right in Bay Ridge. And he would typically be the one driving the car for the carpool when they went over to uh, Ebbets Field. So a lot of great stories, a lot of great things, and that's pretty much the size of it. I mean, uh, Dodgers leaving Brooklyn, that's a whole epic on and of itself. But I know this video was a little bit longer than usual, but I really uh, have a lot of heart and soul for this, uh, for baseball, for Brooklyn, for the Mets, for the Dodgers. And I thought I needed to really do a, a kind of an opus on this one because it just I had so much to say about it and uh, I really hope you guys enjoy it and if uh, you guys can please subscribe to the channel I'd really appreciate it if you guys have any um, ideas for videos please let me know please subscribe please drop me a comment I'd really appreciate that and uh, it means a lot to me folks it really does because I love doing these videos and uh, I love talking about Brooklyn and bringing uh, cool stuff to your to your direction Honestly, folks I just want to say a big shout out to my son Matt you know I'm here in downtown Sarasota Sarasota is the city of the arts. We run our foundation. It's the Waffles Foundation. We lost Matt a couple of years ago, and Matt would just be so amazed and so, so, I don't know what the word would be, happy. Um, you know, I wish he was here to stand with me because we never went to Sarasota, but if Matt was standing here right now, he would be so amazed. And so it's his favorite group was, our, was ACDC. Brian Johnson just lives over that bridge over there in Bird Key. Uh, right behind me, somewhere on the Witch Apartments, Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin has a, has a penthouse. And uh, Mick Jagger's got a penthouse up, up around here somewhere. So he would just be so amazed. And apparently they walk around and haven't seen them yet. But you know what? Matt would just be so amazed to be in and around this wonderful place. And uh, I think Matt's in a wonderful place now. I miss him. I love him. I'm going to put a picture up here of Matt. And uh, just hoping one day I'll see him real soon, one day. So I love you guys. It's Al signing off. Take care.